tell you a little bit about the company in a second, but I'd say my favorite app, because um, I use it constantly, is Waze. Um, uh, just uh, a great app. But my, my kind of favorite, more frivolous app is uh, Distiller, which is, if anybody drinks whiskey or likes whiskey, it's a great application for helping find new whiskeys to, to try. Uh, it, it doesn't help your bank account very much. I'd have to use my <laughs> Bank of America app more often uh, if I took all their recommendations. But um, just out of curious, so we, we like doing this as kind of a little exercise. It's a good icebreaker, gets everybody to know who, who each, each other are. But I think it's also good, to, you know, it puts folks in the mindset of, you know, what makes mobile special, right? What makes the apps that we love, what makes them special, right? Um, and it gets you thinking. So just out of curiosity, of those apps people mentioned, how many people kind of use them for work? For some, for some way, right? Whether it's getting information, it's a lot, right? And how many of those are actually provided by your company? Yours, right? That's it. So I think it's a good kind of segue into what we're gonna talk about, um, which is this concept of mobile and the disruptions caused by mobility and the future of work. Um, I, I mentioned um, just a little bit about Mobiquity. Um, I know we've talked to a number of the folks in the room already, but we're essentially, we call ourselves a mobile engagement provider, but for lack of a better term, it's we're a mobile professional services firm. Um, our, we, our clients are uh, essentially you know, global 2,000 enterprises, and we help them essentially across the entire life cycle of mobile solutions. So everything from mobile strategy uh, and consulting, um, that's where I sit in, in the business, to systems integration, user experience design, um, development, um, support, maintenance, um, digital marketing services, so kind of soup to nuts, right? We can do uh, everything for our clients. We just celebrated our four year anniversary, so we're based in Greater Boston. Um, just celebrated our four year anniversary on, on Friday um, and have grown to over 400, 400 uh, uh, um, employees in a fairly short period of time. So um, one of the things we also do at Mobiquity um, is we run something called the Wireless Innovation Council. So I. I lead that for the organization. Um, and it was created on Mobiquity's in, in, inception. So th the idea was, you know, um, there's a lot of kind of disruptive elements and innovations that are happening in mobile. Wouldn't it be great if we brought together a number of kind of um, lead thinkers across different vertical industries to kind of come together and explore some of those different um, disruptive elements? Um, so we formed the Wireless Innovation Council, which is comprised of about 15 different firms. So companies like the Weather Channel and Fidelity Investments and Harley-Davidson and Pfizer, um, Halliburton to give you a, a few companies that are on the council. And we kind of get together and we drive, kind of we look into kind of and research some uh, interesting compelling areas. The members kind of select what we want to look into and, and one of the things that we're investigating this year is the future of work. Um, so we just had our first event down in Miami a couple weeks back and we thought, hey, it'd be great to kind of talk about this. We're still actually investigating as part of the council, but I thought it'd be a good um, uh, uh, dialogue to kind of have um, with everybody here. So I'd like to kind of make this interactive as much as possible, which is also why I kind of want to get an understanding of who's in the room. Um, certainly feel free to ask questions, and I think we'll have time anyway, you know, hopefully plenty of time. But one of the things uh, I'd like to start out with is saying, well, what is mobile, right? Um, you know, I, I've been, by way of background, I've been in the mobile space for 20 years, so before Mobiquity, I was an industry analyst myself for Yankee Group for 12 years, focused on the enterprise mobility space. And before that, I actually started on the carrier side uh, of, of the world. Um, and so, you know, when I think of mobile, you know, the reality is mobile isn't just one technology. In fact, it's kind of more of a state of being, right? You're, you're mobile, right? It's, but people tend to think about it as a technology, whether it's a smartphone or wireless networks, et cetera. The way I kind of like to think about it is it's actually a new computing platform, right, that's been emerged as a result of a series of disruptions, right? Um, and if you think about the kind of first wave of mobile disruption was, you know, way back, you know, starting, you know, in the, in the 80s and really kind of picking up speed in the 90s, right, the communication phase of voice and texting, and that was tremendously disruptive, um, right? It, it gave people the ability to communicate wherever they were. Um, and that lasted, you know, quite some time until we saw the first introduction of, you know, smart devices. And believe it or not, smart devices do predate, you know, the iPhone, right? So, um, you know, Nokia, as you folks know, and Ericsson and um, 
and BlackBerry, right? You know, all kind of were that first wave of smart devices, and with that, really kind of gave the introduction of mobile data, right? So mobile email, right, which some people are still addicted to, right, uh, and mobile web, and that was again tremendously disruptive, and that disruption lasted for quite some time until finally we did see the launch of iPhones, right, and that really created this new disruption that I like to call smart ecosystems, right, which was the creation of a entirely new mobile economy around applications um, that really Apple spawned and you know Android has followed. Um, and at the same time, we saw the intersection of that with social and cloud, really at the same time, and the emergence of you know big data analytics. Um, and that you know we're we're still kind of feeling the results of what I call the appification phase, right? Um, but we're also now, what I think, into a fourth wave of mobile disruption, which I kind of call the contextual phase, because we've seen rise of a whole new slew of disruptions, right? From wearables and Internet of Things and mobile video and augmented reality and mobile transactions, right? You talked about payments really kind of picking up steam. Um, we're in the midst of that. I think what's interesting to take away from this is a couple of things. One is, again, it's not one technology, right? It's a group of technologies coming together that's creating a very new world for everyone, right? Consumers and employees and businesses alike. Um, and the other thing is these disruptions are continuing to come upon us. These waves are continuing to crash upon us at increasing rates, right? So that first phase lasted probably 20 years, right? And the next phase lasted probably eight to 10. And then the third phase lasted about four to five. And so with each phase, we see more and more disruptions emerge and less and less time between them. Uh, and it's forcing everybody to kind of rethink, you know, um, how to kind of keep up. And just to kind of illustrate that a little bit, um, this is hard to see. But this is, ironically enough, a Radio Shack ad from 1991. And if you look at what's in this Radio Shack ad, everything on this page, this is real, by the way. I didn't make this up. This is more beautiful than I, if I could have made it up. Everything on this page has been disrupted by mobility, by essentially your mobile phone. So, oh, what happened there? I don't know. A little, uh, um, but essentially it's got your computer, right? So the computer here that costs $1,600 is probably not as powerful as the one you're carrying around in your pocket right now. Obviously a cell phone, uh, actually a radar detector, so if you're like me and you use Waze, right, you've got a built-in radar detector, uh, CD player, uh, alarm clock, um, recorder, video, um, video recorder, right, and stereo. Everything in here. And this would have cost you, I think, I can't remember the pricing was, but it was something like um, 15 items would have been kind of more than $2,000, right, easily on this page. So it's tremendously disruptive. And ironically enough, who also was disrupted? But Radio Shack, right, because they used to sell all these things and now they no longer can sell all these things, so they're out of business. But it just kind of puts in context how much things have changed in a fairly short period of time since 1991. And the fact of the matter is that mobile has already transformed the way we work, right? So from the early days of big honking cell phones to you know BlackBerry, which you know gets beat down quite a bit now, but was completely ubiquitous, right, in the in the business space for a long time and, and tremendously empowering, um, to now folks working in Starbucks and alongside their pets, right, at home, um, in utter frustration. Um, so it's not new, but I do think that the, those things, these disruptions that we've just seen are really taking us to that next level and thinking about really what the future of work can be. Um, and the way we um, have started to kind of think about it is that the future of work is really kind of the intersection of, of you can think of through the intersection of three lenses. The first is kind of the employee you know, lens, which is you know, how does mobile technology impact and transform behavior in and out of the office, right? So from the worker point of view themselves. The second lens is the company, right? So how will mobile disruptors shape corporate strategies, right? Th things related to personnel and staffing, to real estate, to things like training, and even health and wellness. How do we think about these things differently now? And then there's also a broader economy lens, right? Which is, will mobility create new business models? will create new ecosystems, um, and we'll be able to utilize assets in very different ways. Um, so we'll talk about this at a pretty high level. I don't have the answers to all these questions, obviously, but I think it's really good kind of foundation to kind of think about things. Um, uh, I've got a quote. I like to kind of put quotes sometimes up and see if anybody recognizes who might have said this. 
So knowledge is the primary resource for individuals and for the economy overall. Does anybody know who said that? Venture a guess. Very famous, Jeff. no, very famous business strategist consultant. Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker, thank you. Give that man a prize. I don't have a prize, but if I did, oh, he has pizza on. in the back. <laughs> his pizza. So um, it's very interesting that Peter Drucker actually coined the term knowledge worker. I don't know if anybody knows that. Does anybody venture guess what year he coined the term knowledge worker? It's not 1992. It's actually much before that. It's 1959. He coined the term knowledge worker. Um, but in 1992, he wrote an article for Harvard Business Review in which he, he talked about the future of work, and particularly the future of the economy really revolves around knowledge work and the knowledge worker. And I like to think about the knowledge, th this concept of knowledge work and knowledge worker because really to, to uh, my belief about the future of work, this is what kind of mobile and this new computing platform can really unleash. Um, Again, not new. Does anybody know what that is? Well, oops, sorry, it's not there yet. Does anybody know what that is? The phone book. No. No. The yellow paper. Nope. No. no, it's that's yellow. That, that, that's a it's ledger. A that's a ledger. That's an accounting it's ledger. An old-fashioned accounting ledger. It's, it's like it easier as we go on. This is. Does anybody know what that is? It's an, that's an inbox, <laughs> and a typewriter, and and a, a slide projector. So, you know, we've had tools, right, obviously, for mobile workers, right? And, and all of these things were disrupted, really, by Microsoft, um, if you think about it, right? All those things we knew, use and love, you know, have replaced those basic fundamental tools that workers used to use. The interesting thing is we still use these things, and they've been around for a really long period of time. Not, not the typewriter, this, these, these apps, right? In a lot of ways, these apps have evolved beyond what they were meant to do, right? So, Excel was meant to really replace an accounting ledger. Um, but how many people just, how many people here use Excel? How many people use it for accounting purposes? No, right? So you're using a tool that was never designed, right, f you know, with the in initial intention. We use it in many, many different ways. And I think that's true for all of these. And so keep that in mind as we kind of go on. Because um, there was another tool we started using, right, which was uh, the BlackBerry, right? So BlackBerry, as I mentioned earlier on, right, so the first kind of mobile, really kind of mobile powerhouse tool for the workforce is the BlackBerry. Um, and I was a big BlackBerry user, right? I got the new BlackBerry every time from RIM, and they sent it to me, it was great. Um, Crackberry, as Ty says, right? Um, the funny thing was with BlackBerry is people started using this in ways it was never designed to as well, right? So people, because you could get your email wherever it was, right, you start using email for a lot more than just email, right? You use it to send messages, right? Hey, I'm running late, right, when people weren't texting. Right? Hey, I'm five minutes late for the meeting. Or, hey, uh, does anybody have this file that they can send me, right? Because people didn't have like file access back, you know, so they'd send an email out, blast an email, people would send the file that they, they'd have. So we started using BlackBerry and email as a default and de facto for so many different things. And as I mentioned, then this came along, right? The iPhone, which moved us from thinking about mobility as beyond just things like email access to an entirely different app economy. And the interesting thing is, the app economy, right, is very interesting because it's taken, in many cases, mostly on the consumer side today, but it's taken very, um, the things we want to do and put them into very, very discrete packages, right? So we've got to think about all the applications that everybody mentioned. They do very, very discrete things in most cases, right? Evernote's great for note taking, right? Um, Espresso, right, great for kind of condensing news. Same thing with Business Insider here, right? Apple Pay is just for payments. Very, very discrete. Right, and very good at what they do. So it's breaking down the tasks into very um, specific things. The interesting thing is that business applications really haven't kind of caught up to that. So the app economy has really been kind of bolstered by consumer facing applications. Right? We all talk about these applications we use, they're targeted at the consumers and we kind of take them and we use them and we adapt to how we want to use them. Um, this is, uh, we, we stole actually the Citrix um, a uh, gentleman named Trenton uh, Kaichol um, spoke at our uh, WIC event in Miami. He leads their CTIO council. Um, and he had these great slides, so I completely stole them, but I'm giving him credit here if anybody asks. But he has this view, which I think is great, which is, listen, you know, we think about life and work life, right? Um, used to be two very distinct things, right? So we had life and, and work life, and that's obviously been intermingled. But the interesting thing is he kind of put a different spin on it, right? Is now in life and work life, we carry these things around with us all the time, and this is how we go through our day, right? We use this as kind of the remote control for our lives in a lot of ways. And so we may start with things like the weather, we may go visit Pinterest, 
And then we get into the office and bam, we get hit by a big system like SAP, right? Um, and we get mired in SAP and the complexities of these big you know, legacy systems. And then we go back to Facebook and Gmail and bang, now we're hit with Salesforce, right? And, and this isn't necessarily a knock on any of these big companies, in some ways it is, right? But, but the, the concept is that the, the, the legacy IT thinking, the le legacy applications and things we use haven't really adapted to the way people want to, to live and, and work, right? And, and the idea is it could be very different, right? Where it's, you know, these, thinking about um, giving and providing tools that provide much more discrete functionality. People, I think a couple of people mentioned Twitter, right? And Twitter I use all the time uh, at, you know, for work purposes. Um, and, you know, there, it's gonna be a mix, right? A mix of the tools that we want and use and we find on our own. And then thinking about how do we think about re-engineering the business tools that we need to provide to our users as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so uh, another Peter Drucker quote, which is from the same article, said the purpose and function of every organization is the integration of specialized knowledge into a common task. And I think that's very, very apt um, for today. So going back to those disruptions I talked about earlier, um, you'll notice that most of them really, you know, it's this convergence of mobile, but not only mobile, but, you know, cloud and social and big data analytics. And if you combine all of those things, right, and folks like IDC call this the, I think the third platform, right, the computing platform, right, is that the term they use? Yep. Um, all these things combined create a new computing platform. And the reason is because it can provide insights, right? And to me, those insights was that knowledge that Peter Drucker kind of talked about. Um, but in order to really kind of talk to do that, you know, organizations must transform themselves, right? So we've got to think differently about our approach to IT, right? Um, thinking about owning boxes, and, and Ty will talk at length about that. And also, you know, an homage to Office Space. I'm a huge fan of the movie. So uh, the way we interact and the way we structure work itself, right? And allow people to work. Um, in a lot of ways, that really means um, the right tool for the right job. One of the things I like to think about, right, is that you think about knowledge workers. Knowledge workers are specialized workers, right? They bring special skills to the table. Um, and I also think about that in the context of contractors. Right? So you hire a contractor right, to do a job. They're very specialized, right? They have very special skills. Well, guess what, right? They don't come to your house and go down to your basement and take the tools you have, right? They bring their own tools, right? They select their own tools, right? They bring their toolbox to, to the job site with them. And in many cases, that, I believe, is how work is going to evolve for knowledge workers, right? They're going to be bringing the tool sets that they need. Now, there are going to be tools that are provided to them in some cases. But in others, it's what are the tools I need to do my very specialized job in a very skilled way. One of the things um, we've done at, at Mobiquity with our team, and Ty actually uh, got us together. We, I, I, I work within a group called Mobile Engagement Advisory Practice, and we have a number of both business and, and tech consultants. So Ty said, I want to run something called the Disruptor Olympics where he had us all kind of um, break into teams and, and identify what we consider kind of disruptive companies in kind of the BDE space. So employee facing applications and, and tools that employees could use. Um, and so we kind of came up with a list and Ty can tell you about the process, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a fun exercise, but it was also kind of enlightening. And we came up with a number of companies and this is a pretty good representative of the companies that kind of bubble up to the top of our list. Um, and you notice there aren't any, you know, familiar names in here, right? So even folks like Salesforce, who we do think is still a, a fairly innovative company, um, and they're a partner of ours, but, um, but you see there's, you know, um, a, a very new set of disruptors that are emerging focused on providing employees with those tools for that future of work. So somebody mentioned Slack earlier, right? Um, that came up, I think, high on our list. Um, I, it was very interesting because one of the, um, companies that we had mentioned was uh, Khan Academy, um, more from the fact that we really thought that, you know, this concept of, of, of individualized learning um, was very compelling. And then just the other day, right, LinkedIn's um, snapped up Linda. I don't know how many people saw that, but to me that's tremendous, right? We actually had LinkedIn before they snapped up Linda. That was, that was one of uh, my team's picks. Because if you think about what LinkedIn has done, right, they, they, you know, if we talk about the knowledge worker, pretty much 
you know, they have a, 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 a stronghold on the eyeballs of the knowledge worker, right? Everybody's on LinkedIn, right? It's the way we network, it's the way we apply for jobs, it's everything. Uh, and now they're using that as a platform, right, to deliver all sorts of other services. And I think this is a, a tremendous example. Um, folks like Daiquiri, uh, is anybody familiar with Daiquiri? Probably not. They're an augmented reality company uh, based in the LA area. And they've come up with an augmented reality helmet um, specifically for industrialized environments. So think of you know, oil and gas environments or warehouse. Um, really powerful, we had them at our, at our WIC as well. Um, doing really interesting things. Um, and certainly, you know, Microsoft with um, HoloLens, you know, is, is a very kind of interesting new take on what computing could be. Um, Domo, I don't know if you saw Domo, just kind of came out, finally kind of had their, you know, uh, official public launch, really around providing those kind of business insights, right, to all sorts of, of workers, right, really thinking about the way we take, you know, analytics, right, but surface them back out to, um, to workers. Um, I mean, there's a number of different examples on here. Ty's favorite is Asana. Who's, has anybody used Asana? Um, Asana is essentially a task management um, yeah, to solution, do to-do to do list. list. But, you know, for collaboration, and Ty has us all using it, um, whether we want to or not, um, but we're using it. Um, but I think it's very, very interesting that, um, you know, this is the next, for me, the next wave of disruption is really on that kind of business to employee tool set front. Um, and then finally, really, to kind of think about that other lens, which is the, um, the economy lens, right? So we think about what these disruptions have done. It's actually even created new business models. Um, so sharing economies, right? So things like Uber and Airbnb and Lyft, you know, really were not possible without all those technologies coming together, right? The social, the mobile, the cloud elements all kind of converging, right, to create these entirely new businesses. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing that from sharing economies to now on-demand labor, right? So TaskRabbit and Handy, um, you know, really for, you know, everyday tasks, you know, going out and finding people who can do things. And it's very interesting, I think, the concept of on-demand labor, um, you know, it can move even from specialized tasks, but if we think about kind of this idea of knowledge work, and perhaps what even LinkedIn could do here is really creating a true on-demand and truly kind of liquid workforce. Right, where people are kind of literally moving between um, projects instead of between jobs and roles. And then finally, what we're also seeing is derivative startups, right? So not only are we seeing new companies emerge like Airbnb, but we're seeing companies emerge to support the economies that they've created, right? So I don't know if anybody's familiar with folks like Pillow and Guesty, but they essentially help people who want to prepare their properties and such for Airbnb. Right, so they've created a whole set of specialized services to now, you know, service these other bigger, bigger, right, uh, emerging shared economies. Um, but essentially, you know, what I kind of want to leave you with is to do all this from my, is going to require um, not only kind of innovative thinking, but also kind of transformation. So most companies are really not in this mindset of being able to make this shift. One of the things that we kind of developed at Mobiquity is this concept we call the mobile transformation framework. And it's really just a kind of a way of thinking about what are all those things that we need to think about? What are the things we need to have in place to take advantage of these disruptions and turn that disruption into, or transform that disruption into innovation opportunities? And so it's from everything from innovation and governance so how do we think about these things as a company? Right? How do we put in place the right processes to really identify what we want to do, right? Um, even from a cultural, from a technology standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, all of those things. Um, moving over to user experience and design. Bless you. Um, there's been a lot of thought given from a user experience standpoint to consumer-facing applications. That certainly has not been the case at all from a business application standpoint. And so we have to apply that same thinking, right, to our employees and to how people work. We have to think about our employees and workers in terms of user journeys, right? So what are they doing? What do they want to do? What are our different personas that we have? We have to apply that same thinking. Um, from an architecture and development standpoint, it certainly has huge implications, right, both from the core IT to support these, but also in terms of the way we kind of build and design applications. Again, very discrete tasks very discrete thinking. Um, 
it was very interesting. We just went through and, and um, completed a, an initial um, strategy project for a, a clinical research organization. So they do, they run research trials for big pharma. And one of the things they came to us and said, we want to think about what the future of work looks like for a clinical research associate and for our biz dev staff. So help us come up with that and think about you know, the concepts behind that. And we applied a different way of thinking for them around that. We took it from that user experience perspective, right? And, and what we found is that you know, the experience they need is this kind of combination of different tools, but in a way that interfaces with them in their day-to-day -day life, right? So their clinical research associates have access to a whole bunch of different systems. They access a whole bunch of different systems, but right now they're using things like laptops and attaching Wi-Fi, and they carry around things like handheld scanners to scan in documents that they sit in an airport gate and do. And so it requires a very different way of thinking, and then on the back end, the integration and the effort to kind of build and, and, and deploy that. Um, and then, you know, on the management side as well, right, things like new management tools, you know, how do we in equip kind of not only bring your own device, but bring your own application, right? How do we think about these different notions? Uh, and then finally, how do we measure that, right? How do we deploy it? How do we measure it, right? How do we engage with our users? There's a whole, you know, a lot of thinking done with how do we engage users on consumer applications, but the same thing has to be true. Um, I've had conversations with companies all, you know, who've deployed Salesforce, for example, and, and other applications, and see very little kind of usage of it, right? Um, particularly in a mobile environment, because it hasn't been designed for use and engagement for when people need access to that, um, to that platform. And so how do we make sure that users are actually engaging and, and working with these tools? So that's kind of the prepared remarks um, that I kind of uh, have gathered for today. Um, but I'd love to kind of use this as a, a kind of jumping off point for um, discussion or questions. Well, 